and uh, you're watching the number one podcast in the YouTube wrestling community, and I'm your host, Jean-Paul Leek, and this is Rope Break. Family Tuesday morning, we are here bright and early for your Monday night Raw review, and of course, last night was the go-home show for SummerSlam, and this Raw, you know, unfortunately, it hasn't been following the trend of SmackDown. I had my fingers crossed and hoping it would, as in the show is getting better and better. This week was another, like last week, kind of 50-50 week. You know, last week had the great Ric Flair segment and, you know, a few other good things, and then this week it's like, eh, you know, they had some good stuff as well, but then also it's like really like this is the go-home show, the biggest party of the summer, SummerSlam. You know, but we did get some good stuff. But then, of course, you know, it is Monday Night Raw. It is three hours. They, It's impossible for them to write three hours of good television. So there is obviously some bullshit going to slip through the cracks. But we'll get into the full review. But before then, family, you know, I just want to wish you all, you know, hope you're all doing well. Thank you for joining us. We have a busy week this week. You know, um, Emergence, Monday Night Raw, obviously, NXT. We have uh, NXT TakeOver, and we also have... AEW Dynamite that night as well. So it's going to be busy previews and predictions for the the NXT TakeOver 30. And then we're going to have the SummerSlam on Sunday. And so it's a busy week, guys, but stay tuned with us. But let's get in to the Monday Night Raw. So like I said, this was the go-home show right when it started. Of course, it was the Then Now Forever video. That thing was glitching out. It's like, okay, what's going on here? You know, if you have any brain cells, you know, okay, it's just retribution screwing, you know, with the but the video truck or whatever you want to call it. So then we go to the actual first segment, and that's Drew McIntyre. He's in the ring. And then, of course, we see a replay of what happened last week with Ric Flair. And then uh, Drew says that Rand- what Randy did last week, you know, by brutalizing Ric Flair was unforgivable. He's not just a legend and a 16-time, you know, world champion and an icon, but he's a 71-year-old man at the end of the day. So... You know, he's like, you grew up with him, you know, you're friends with him. Like, how could you do this to somebody like that? And then Rick, you know, Rick said he loved you, all this stuff. So he keeps going on and on, says, oh, Randy's pure evil, McIntyre. You know, then he's like, at SummerSlam, you're not facing an old man. You're facing a pissed off six foot seven fire breathing dragon, and I'm going to make you pay. So then there's, of course, while this is going on, you kind of see flashes of the match cards that are going to happen tonight and all like weird camera angles. So a lot of technical difficulty shit still going on. Again, retribution is like Hulkamania. They're running wild. So it's like, okay, what's going on? And then, you know, again, all this is going on. And then we go to uh, commercial break. Then when we're back from commercial break, uh, something that I liked last week from SmackDown is when there's shit going down in the back, you know, the locker area the you know, whatever you want to call it, you have a lot of people walking around. It's not just one guy standing there next to a production crate with nobody else around him. You actually saw a bunch of people. So they're all backstage. And of course they're all gathering because of everything going on with retribution. So Drew's like, guys, you know, this is bullshit. And, you know, but they're like, Oh, we just want to ask you, you know, how's Ric Flair doing? And Drew's like, Oh, last I heard he's good. Like, why would Drew be the only one who knows Ric Flair? I mean, I get it, Drew's feuding with Randy, and that's the storyline, but it's like, I don't know how close really Drew McIntyre and Ric Flair are. Like, why would you ask him? Why wouldn't you ask, like, I don't know, a WWE higher up or, you know, whoever is running the show, like Bruce Pritchard or whoever the fuck. So, anyway, you know, they had to just get in the little sympathy angle thing in there. So, you know, he's like, you know, retribution, they got to be stopped. He's like, we don't even know if we're going to make it to SummerSlam the way these guys are going. So we got to band together and take him down. So then, of course, Rollins approaches. He laughs. He's like, okay, you know, you're trying to be a leader. I get it, you know. But there's only one leader here, and that's the Monday Night Raw Messiah. And then Drew says that Seth has been here for five years. Nobody respects him. He's like, nobody liked you when you were the champion. You know, you weren't a leader. You weren't a teacher. You weren't any of these things. He's like, I'm, you know, in the time that I've been champion, you know, people have respected me a lot more. And then, um, you know, of course, Ricochet, and they start laughing because Drew mentions uh, what he did to Dominic last week. And then Ricochet and Cedric are in the back because they're presented like high school kids. So maybe they are are actually a part of Retribution. But they're presented like kids and they just snickering. And Rollins is like, what the fuck are you guys laughing at? And then Ricochet is like, oh, a little birdie told me that Rey Mysterio is going to come and he's going to get his receipt. 
And he's like, Rollins is like, what? And he's like, no, like you saw what I did to his eye and what I did to Dominic. There's no way. It's, it's more like a thing where he's not confident. He's like scared that Mysterio would kick his ass. And then Cedric's like, oh, well, I heard from the same little birdie, you know, I heard the same thing as well. And it's like, really? Like, they couldn't have just been like, hey, man, what you did to Mysterio, you know, you know you got it coming. You better watch your back. Like, you couldn't be serious. It'd be a little birdie told me, like, I, you know, hey, so much for the no more PG era. You know, we're supposed to be TV 14, yes. We go back to the ring after this, and then we see MVP. He makes his entrance. He's with uh, Lashley and Benjamin. So still the camera angles, they're kind of getting all over the place. And then uh, MVP's like, you know, the Hurt Business, we're out here. We want to make a statement. We're not like Retribution that just, you know, they, they kind of are sneaky and they attack from the shadows. He's like, no, we come right out in the open and we stake our claim. And then MVP says that they're not tough, but him, Benjamin, and Lashley, they're tough. And he asks who benefits from Retribution. He says, you know, the, if you follow the trail, it leads right to catering. And in catering is where you find guys like Apollo Crews, Ricochet, Cedric Alexander, and Mustafa Ali. And MVP says Crews is behind Retribution because they showed up, you know, just about the same time when he was facing him for the United States Championship. So then Cruz comes out. He says that he knows MVP makes a lot of excuses. He's like, but really, dude, this is a new low for you. And then MVP is like, hey, Apollo, I know what you're doing you know, with your goons, you know, and then retribution, but this is really low. So then MVP says that until Cruz won the United States Championship, Apollo was more hot and cold than an old car. You know, you're, he's like, your pushes were like, and then, and then a raggedy car. You stop, you go, you stop, you go. And then he's like, and it's the fear that you have, that you know if you lose that belt, you're never going to get pushed again. Like, you're done. You're just going to be forgotten about. And Apollo, he's like, you know what? You're right. Because I do, you know, feel that this belt has given me more opportunity. So that's why I'm going to fight my hardest and I'm never going to give it up. So I do like that. I like the thing from uh, MVP in the beginning where he was like, oh, yeah, you know, this is all Retribution's fault. You know, he's causing this. It's a good heel way to twist it. And then I like this from Apollo, you know, because really, like, what was he before he got inserted into this? You know, he was the, the MVP of catering. But then after that, MVP is like, listen, man, you're just a child, and I'm going to prove at SummerSlam, you know, who is the rightful United States Championship, our champion. So he sends Benjamin and Lashley into the ring. Cruz slides in. You know, they're kind of playing this cat and mouse game. And then when we come back, we get Apollo Cruz versus Shelton Benjamin. And then this match was pretty much set up in the sense where if Apollo Crews beats Shelton, then Shelton and Lashley aren't going to be allowed to be at ringside. So it's like, okay, it makes a little bit of sense. You know, we saw last week or Shelton won. So this is kind of like maybe payback kind of thing. So it's like, eh, okay. But this match really didn't get nowhere. Um, again, really quick because, of course, our truth and the ninjas are Akira Tozawa. They had to run through, so that uh, distracted Shelton Benjamin. He was like, huh, what's going on? So then, you know, Apollo Crews picks up the victory. So, you know, they're going to be barred from ringside. We're going to get a legit match. That's one thing that I'm like, okay, I like, but I don't know why we can't see, uh, you know, a good match between two of the best athletes that Monday Night Raw has. You know, why, do, why does it always got to be the, you know, the run-in from the ninjas of the 24-7 championship? So then as soon as this thing ends, Lashley and MVP, they storm the ring. They're pissed. They, you know, they're giving the boots to Apollo Crews. Ricochet, Cedric, and Ali, they come out. They try to make the save. The baby faces clear the ring, and they leave. But then R-Truth comes running back down for whatever reason, I guess just to set this bullshit up. He gets knocked out by Shelton Benjamin. One, two, three. New 24-7 champion. Does anybody care? No. MVP, though, he gets on the mic and he tells Cruz, he's like, you got to choose two guys tonight because we're having a six-man elimination tag match. Again, anybody care? No. Speaking of things that literally nobody cares about, you know, the show started hot and then, like I said, I was hoping it would be legit like SmackDown, but, you know, that shows how far your hopes and dreams go in WWE. But Angel Garza, he's backstage with um, Demi, whatever the hell her bullshit name is, from The Bachelor. And he gives her a rose. Ivar shows up and he's like, hey, you know, I, you know, why don't you keep talking about me and all the raids I've been on? And he's like, you know, do you want to be my plus one for Raw Underground tonight? Hands are a big turkey leg or whatever the hell it was. And Garza says that he will take Ivar out after the break. And he throws, you know, 
he throws the meat on the floor. Ivor holds his hand out and then, you know, kind of like Thor. And then the, the meat comes flying back into his hand. So it's like, you know, you kind of laugh a little bit, but then you realize like what you're watching and you're like, you know, I wish it was presented a little bit more serious tone because it's like, okay, are you ever going to use those powers in a match where it benefits you? I mean, you know, no, because it's just something to like be a little gimmicky thing, but whatever. The, my main gripe is what we see here going into this match. So um, this, I mean, the match gets underway, you know, Ivar, you know, he's pretty much, they're going at it. But the whole thing is, is then you see Demi backstage and she's talking with Dawkins and Dawkins will go, like, oh, yo, let me get your number and all this shit. So then they're kind of like, uh, you know, wh why does it like the whole feud is mostly the Street Profits and Andrade and Angel Garza. But then you got the Viking Raiders and this Demi from The Bachelor is thrown in here. And it's just like you had, you know, you had a good soup. And you started adding too many ingredients to it. And now the soup tastes like shit. And you don't even know what the ingredients you started were with. That's what this is. You're like, who's feuding? Is it the Viking Raiders? Is it Apollo? And or not Apollo. Is it, um, is it on, uh, I can't, Angelo Dawkins and Demi? You know, like, who, like who's, or are they all feuding? Are they feuding over the chick, the belts? You know, what the hell's going on? It doesn't make any sense, but. This thing ends, uh, Garza pokes Ivar in the eyes, and then he hits that drop kick on Ivar and gets the pin. Like a drop kick right to the face. I don't know if this could, because he couldn't hit the wing clipper. I think we saw him put someone away with the drop kick before. I hope that's not a new finisher, because I mean, in today's day and age, a drop kick is like the first move you do, you know, at the start of the match. So, um, you know, I'd like to see the wing clipper again, but like I said, maybe it's just because of the size of his opponent. But after the match, you know, Dawkins and Demi, they're on the screen. They congratulate him. And then he's like, hey, what's happening with Demi, you know? And then she's like, oh, I can't wait to watch their tag team match at SummerSlam. And then Dawkins makes fun of his outfit and then asks about – he's like, oh, you know, maybe I'll talk to Charlie Caruso too. And then he's like, no, this is bullshit. So he runs back because, of course, he's a player, you know, and he has to, you know, defend both his women I guess I don't know like I said like does anybody really care about this is anybody you know pop for this anybody care no the only thing people try to care about is the raw tag team titles and they're like an afterthought or maybe the fact that you know Montez Ford got poisoned you know that got brought up and we saw him later on tonight but it's like really like your best friend you know your brother you know got poisoned and you're trying to get laid like really so then um they're they're now then they start talking about this video and I was like, oh, maybe it was a, you know, an explicit video of Garza since he likes to rip his pants off all the time. Because the way that they were selling this was that it was a video of Garza, something that would like get him in trouble. So he's like, oh, you can't show this. And Joe's like, oh, well, I've seen it and I showed everybody. I showed the Street Profits. I showed your mama. I showed. And it's like, okay, Joe, like I know you're, you're legit on commentary, but sometimes just tone it back with the gimmickiness. Just, you know, whatever. So then Zelina, she has Joe, she's like, what are you talking about? This is bullshit. And like I said, he's like, oh, you know, I showed everybody, blah, blah, blah. So then Dawkins is backstage with Demi. Garza shows up. Vega and Andrade, they show up. Charlie Caruso, she's like, what the hell's going on? Dawkins tells them. He's like, let's roll the clip. And again, I'm starting to think we're going to see some kind of like explicit porno film with Angel Garza. You know, so maybe something with Pat Patterson. You know, that's why he's getting a push. Just kidding. He's not getting a push at all. And then we see, you know, Zelina, she's poisoning Montez Ford's drink. So it's like, okay, why wasn't Zelina the one who was trying to stop this? Or, you know, maybe Alistair Black, because that's his wife, you know. But, oh, you know, every other couple likes to be portrayed on screen except those two. So what am I talking about? So then, of course, she's like, oh, I don't know what's going on here. This is bullshit. She blames Charlie Caruso. Then Dawkins steps in, and he said it's taking all of his effort to not give them what they deserve. And then he says, because he's waiting for his brother, Ford comes flying into the frame and they beat Andrade and Garza away. So we see Montez Ford, he comes back. But, you know, that's what we should have seen all along. It shouldn't, well, I don't know why we had to get the Viking Raiders in this, Demi. We had to get all this stuff. You know, you really took the show from a high point in the opening segment and then you're really dragging it down. And believe me, the drag down just keeps coming. Because then we get Mickey James versus Natalia, which I was looking forward to. But pretty much as soon as this match starts, you know, we see a little bit of action. Uh, Mickey, you know, hits a, the Mickey DDT. Natalia shoves her off. They hit a double clothesline. 
You know, so they they are mixing it up a little bit. It's getting somewhere. But then Seth Rollins, he comes to the ringside. And then, you know, you're not even fo- – the camera's not even on the action. The camera's just on Samoa Joe and Seth Rollins because they're going back and forth. Rollins is like, hey, I don't know why you're bullshit, saying that you know Mysterio is going to be here. Is he going to be here? Where's your proof? You know, you, you say you know all these things. You know, how the hell do you – you know, who do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. You know, they're just going at it. I'm trying to watch and pay attention to the match. They're not even showing the match. You know, I'm big Mickey James fan. I was like, oh, this is legit. She's coming back. But we don't see anything. The only thing we really see is Natalia knocks her out of the ring. She can't get back in. So, obviously, we're probably going to see a match again between these two. But it sucks that it's like the first match back. You're pretty much an afterthought. So, then, of course, you know, Lana, she has to do the TikTok shit. So, she's filming Mickey James on the floor. Mickey gets up, hits the Mick kick. And then, obviously, while all this is still going on, Seth and Joe, they're still going at it. You know, if Dominic shows up tonight, he's like, hey, if they show up, I want you to know they won't make it to SummerSlam, all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. So then we go to commercial break, and when we come back, we have Bailey and Sasha. They come out for a tag match, and then Sasha complains about their schedule and that they both have to wrestle Asuka at SummerSlam. Bailey says that they can't wait because it's a night off for them. You know, so they do their laugh, <laughs> their heel laugh. I love these two. They're, to me, as much as I like Asuka, they're the top of the women's division on uh, the main roster. And Bailey says that Asuka thinks that she's smart, but she says she's the empress of stupidity. Banks agrees and says that Asuka can't beat them in one night. And then they both argue about who will beat Asuka first. Obviously, you know, they're like, oh, you know, let you should do it. No, 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 you should do it. And that's a ploy because it's like, well, they want you to face the. They want the other one to face the fresh Asuka, because obviously Bailey's like, well, if Sasha goes first and loses her title, she'll at least beat, you know, Asuka up a little bit. So then I'll have a better chance of retaining. So you already see that little bit of tension there, where they're like, no, no, you should go first. No, you should go first. And then Banks says that nobody can stop them, and Bailey says they'll celebrate all the way to payback, where they will defend the women's championship. And I believe that Bailey says that she will go first. I believe that during the promo, she's like, okay, yeah, I'll go first and I'll beat her. And then you'll be able to tap her out really easily with the bank statement. So then um, Shana, she interrupts, she makes her way to the ring. And she says that it doesn't matter what happens at SummerSlam because she has the winner of this. And they're like looking around like, really? Like, what do you do? Just, you know, like, you know, you, you tapped out the Becky and then won a couple meaningless matches, but you know, or got rolled up by Becky, excuse me. And then uh, Asuka comes out, and then she's speaking Japanese, and she says that Baszler will have to team with her before we, they can fight each other. So then we get this match, the Golden Role Models versus Asuka and Shayna Baszler. And this match was pretty good. You know, I like I said, Sasha and Bailey aren't just good because of their mic work. They're good in the ring as well. Shayna Baszler, you know, she's fantastic. Asuka, you know, you guys already know what I think of her. This match was really good, though. Um, the only major problem, like I had, was, you know, you yeah, kind of towards I would say the beginning ish middle of this thing. Shayna Baszler gets, I don't know, she's on the outside, and somebody hits the back of the plexiglass, and then it's like the Kool Aid Man bursts through. Hey, 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 you know, it's free. You know, it's fat and high. She comes through, she bursts in, and she starts taking out. Shayna Baszler and what we've seen in previous weeks when this happens ding 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 that should have been a bell ring you know the winners are Asuka and Shayna you know but I guess you know man we don't do the same rules every week it's like we shake yeah is there gonna be DQs tonight oh yeah oh no you know the magic eight ball that's just what they go by so who the hell knows but at the end of this thing um eventually you know they kind of fight you know Pat Buck all them they kind of send her back like no 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 you were you know what was she like um a band for two weeks or indefinitely or some bullshit. It's like, okay, whatever. So she's out of here. And then eventually Shayna comes back. But at the end of this thing, Bailey hits the Bailey to belly, but Shayna kicks out and the Baszler knocks Banks out of the ring. Uh, but Bailey, and then slams Bailey. She does kind of like that gut wrench suplex and then knees her and applies, applies the Kira food to clutch, but Banks breaks it up. Oscar drags Sasha out of the ring. And then she applies the Oscar lock on the outside. Bailey lifts up Baszler, but she gets out, immediately puts on the Kira Fuda clutch again, and she taps out. So Bailey taps out to the Kira Fuda clutch. The winner, I would assume you could say the baby face is here because Shane is kind of like a baby face. So it's like, oh, okay. But the winner is Asuka and Shayna Baszler. 
Then we go to a commercial break. We see a replay of the contract signing last week. Rollins, you know, Dominic, all that good stuff. Probably the best segment next to the Ric Flair thing. I mean, to me, those were like 1A and 1B. You could say you liked one more than the other, and I couldn't really argue that because both of them I thought were fantastic segments. But we see Apollo Crews, he's backstage with his boys, and he's like, hey, you know, I got to pick, you know, only two of you guys, you know, I, it's a, you know, six man and there's four of us here. So I got to go with Ricochet and Ali. Cedric is like, dude, why are you being bullshit? And he's like, hey, you were put in the full Nelson. I know how that feels. It took me out of commission for how many weeks? You know, you were in it last week. I'm just giving you the night off, man. So then they make their way up, you know, to the ring to get ready for their match. Or, you know, wherever to get ready for their match. And then we see Randy Orton. He walks into the shot. And then that's pretty much it. <laughs> like, okay. So then Drew McIntyre, he's backstage. And he's in thought. Shawn Michaels comes up to him. And he's like, hey, you know, I understand how upset you are. How angry you are with Randy. You know, we're all, you know, we all love Ric Flair. You know, especially me. You know, you know how close I am with him. And, you know, so we're all frustrated. But you can't let that frustration you know, carry you into SummerSlam because Randy Orton, he will take advantage of that. And then um, Drew's like, you know, thank you for believing in me. You know, you always believed in me when you guys brought me to NXT. You didn't let my past define me going, oh, this guy's just going to be bullshit again. You know, hey, you know, you're the six foot, you know, even though they say six foot five here and they said six foot seven in the opening segment. So, hey, you know, two inches matter, you know, ask the ladies, but he's like, you know, the six foot five, 260 pound Scottish stud. He's like, I knew that's who you were, you know, and you've come a long way. And then Sean says that he remembers Drew driving five hours every day to watch him, to film him, even though he had a torn tricep. And that's how McIntyre knows that he's the guy that when he beat Brock Lesnar, you know, you set the WWE championship free. And he's like, you've earned all this, you know, so don't question yourself. He's like, but he wants to go out there tonight. By, now, this is Sean talking. He's like, I want to go out there tonight, and I want to talk to Randy by myself. You know, don't come out there with me. I don't want interference. I just want me and him. But then after that, or, and then obviously Drew agrees. You know, he's like, oh, okay, you know, I'll let you go out there and get RKO so it sets up some heat for my match. You know, thanks, Sean. So then we see Ruby and Liv. They're backstage. The Iconics walk up. Billy says that she won't be able to compete tonight. But Peyton will take her place, and they argue for a little bit. Ruby's pulled away by Liv, and it's like, oh, okay, you know. So we're getting the match, it's, you know. I'll talk about this feud when we get there, but the one thing that is kind of cool, the camera turns, and we see Jessamyn Duke and Marina Shafir, and they're sitting with Shayna Baszler. So it looks like we're getting the, the horsewomen on Monday Night Raw, or at least for right now, we'll see them on Raw Underground. So then when we come back to a commercial break, we see the shit show of the match. And to be honest, this was the only time in Monday Night Raw that I actually fell asleep. And, you know, it wasn't a very long sleep because this match wasn't very long. But what I did wake up to see was the ending. And that was pretty much Billy Kay and, uh, and Ruby Riot because uh, Billy wasn't wrestling. So she's on the outside. So she shoves Ruby. And then Liv, she's like, hey, you know, what, what the hell? This is bullshit. So she gets involved, but Peyton knocks her down. And then Ruby's like, oh, my God, Liv, are you okay? And they throw, uh, you know, they throw Ruby back in the ring. Paint hits her finisher, the deja vu, kind of like a – I don't even know what you would call it. I don't – kind of like a neck – swinging neck breaker kind of thing almost. So she hits that. One, two, three. The Iconics get the win. And, you know, I, again, I don't understand this feud. This is almost like the Raw Tag Team things where it's like, I don't even understand the purpose, the point of this feud, what's going on here. You know, the Iconics are heels, and, and they're good heels. They do, you know, what they do and the characters they play, they do very well. And then you have Ruby Riot, who is like, oh, you know, I was being bullshit. I was heel. I was angry. I'm trying to redeem myself, turn face. And then Liv is just kind of there. And it's like, okay, yeah, I know Liv set up the thing, the distraction to lose but are you trying to cause friction between these two? Because this isn't going to make them grow stronger. If anything, that should have happened and Ruby kicks out and they still win. And it's like, we fought through adversity. Maybe we have something here, you know, maybe we can fully trust each other and be legit again. But instead when you lose, that's just going to cause more animosity, more friction. And like, nobody wants to see Ruby ride and live Morgan feud. You tried that before. It literally didn't get off the ground. So I don't understand why the Iconics win here, but they do. So then um, 
we see the bodyguard. He's standing outside for Raw Underground. Shane walks up. Hey, big man. You know, the same thing we see every time, 945, 950. He's like, we got to get ready. It's soon time for Raw Underground. Like, do we, are we, we're probably going to see that next Monday, too. Hey, big man, you getting ready? No, dude, he forgot. You know, this is only the fourth week of Raw Underground. He compl- it, it slipped his mind. So then we returned um, Raw Underground. We got Eric. He's beating the crap out of some guy. Dolph Ziggler, you know, he's like, oh, you know, hey, I'm here. You know, let, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. So Ziggler, you know, they start – him and Eric start going at it. Um, Eric's, you know, pretty much dominating this thing, as you would think. But then um, Ziggler chokes him out. <laughs> you know, you're watching that, and you're like, okay. I mean, nothing against Ziggler. You know, he's legit. And you look at him, you know, both these guys look like hell of athletes. But I don't know. I don't – and then Ivar, he runs in to make the save. So then and he knocks uh, Dolph into the crowd. So it's like, okay, at the end of the day, the Viking Raiders, you could say, stand tall. But it's like, why does, why does Eric got to always look like a loser? Like, well, I, don't, I don't understand what this hate for Eric is. Does this have heat because of his wife? Because WWE thought she was bullshit for whatever reason. And it's like, you know, I, I don't get this. The Viking Raiders should both be portrayed legit. Just because Ivar is fatter doesn't mean he's more legit. You know, I don't get that. But anyway, you know, that was that. I didn't really care for that first segment from Raw Underground too much. But then we get Rain Dominic. They make their way to the ring. And Ray says that there's only one word to describe how he's felt since Extreme Rules, and that's pain. Initially, it was because of what Seth did to his eye, but even more now because of what Seth did to Dominic. He said he had to watch his son get crucified on the rope, and it made him feel rage he's never felt before. He should have been there to take the beating for his son, and he might not be cleared to compete, but he will protect his son. At SummerSlam, he's going to be Dominic's corner, and he's going to watch him beat Seth Rollins' ass. Dominic thanks his father and says that he knows what he was getting himself into, and he knows what he has to do to defend the honor of the Mysterio name. And then Ray says that Dominic has no idea how proud he is or how much he loves and admires him. And his ad- admiration and determination will defend the family, and he knows that he will be ready, and if Seth gets near them tonight, he won't make it to SummerSlam. So then Rollins and Murphy, they appear on the screen, and he said that he never took Ray for an idiot, but he brought Dom here to Monday Night Raw, and he's putting him in harm's way tonight for what? Himself? And he's like, you're selfish, Ray. You're a sorry excuse for a father. And Seth, Seth says that he doesn't understand why Ray Mysterio continues putting himself and his son in the way. Seth says that he knows now he doesn't have to be or doesn't have to be Ray. It will be the Mysterio name that makes the ultimate sacrifice. So then Ray invites Seth down to the ring, but Rollins laughs and he said that he can't see and Dom can't walk straight. So he's like, is this what you really want? Like, dude, you can barely see. Dominic can't even walk. I'm like, okay, if that's what you want, you ask for it. So then obviously they come down, Ray and Dominic, they kind of run away. They're like dodging them and they're just going after Mysterio. They're kind of just ignoring Dominic, like, oh, okay, not thinking much of it. And as soon as they have their back turned, Dominic grabs the kendo, two kendo sticks. He sneaks up behind Rollins, whacks the shit out of him, whacks Murphy, throws his dad the kendo stick. They start going to town. It's like opening day of baseball. They're just swinging for the hills, man. They're just beating the crap out of these guys. And then, um, you know, they make their escape. So it was all just a trap. I really like this segment because when you're watching it, you know, obviously fantastic promo by Ray Mysterio and Dominic. Um, he's going to be in the corner. This is going to be a street fight. So, you know, Murphy's probably going to be out there. All four of these guys are going to get involved in this match. It's going to be pure, pure chaos, but – with the four guys involved, I'm sure it's going to be a hell of a match. I'm super excited for it, and I like how the faces, you know, they look strong going into it. So then we see Cedric. He's sitting there backstage. He's all like, so. Then MVP walks up. He tries the same song and dance. Hey, man, listen, my offer still stands on the table. If you want to join me, you know. You know he's like, hey, you know, just think about it. But if, if not. You know, you can just be the new MVP of catering since your boy Apollo Crews is, you know, he's moved on and he's left you here at the bus stop, man. He, you know, he's going on to greener pastures and you're just sitting here. So think about it, man. Join me. So then when we get come back, you know, it's another Raw Underground segment. And this is Aturo Ruha and he's going against Riddick Moss. You know, both of these guys, they won last week. So it's like, okay, you know, we're building a little momentum now. Both these guys are pretty tough. They start going at each other, you know, really beating the hell out of each other. I mean, this is one of these things where you almost you just got to watch it 
you know, I'm not going to run through the raw underground things. Like, I mean, it's just kind of like fight club, you know, whatever. It's just like work punches. They're going at each other. Eventually this thing ends. They're both on the outside. And then there's two other guys in the crowd who kind of like, you know, hit them because it's just like, you know, anything goes. So they're hitting them. And then they turn to these other guys, start beating the shit out of them. And Shane gets in. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, man, that's it. That's it. Like, you know, hey, that's it for now. So both these guys, Ruha and uh, Riddick Moss, they both, you know, still look pretty strong, I guess you could say here, in the Raw Underground division or whatever you want to call it. So then we get into the six-man elimination tag match. This was, again, another thing where I'm like, okay, like if you would have just had the first segment and had Apollo Crews beat Shelton, okay, Shelton gets his 24-7 championship back. And, you know, okay, boom, MVP could say, hey, you know, you're bullshit. I don't need my two guys. I'll beat you at SummerSlam. And that's all the build we got for this. I'd be fine. To me, this build that we got here, you know, it, it makes me care about this match less. And I feel WWE so good with that, where when we actually care about something, they find a way to make us care about it less. So uh, we start this thing with uh, Ali uh, and Ricochet. They, they pretty much got eliminated right away. Um, you had Lashy. He came in against Ali. He hit a dominator. Mustafa Ali done. You know, thanks for your return. You know, glad you could join Monday Night Raw. So then Benjamin tags in, and he hits Ricochet with the pay dirt. So Ricochet's done. Okay, so now we set up the, you know, the three-on-one. So Apollo, you know, he hits that toss power bomb on Shelton. He gets eliminated. So we see Shelton Benjamin get pinned twice in one night. Oh, wait, I lied. We see Shelton Benjamin get pinned three times in one night because what happens? Cedric Alexander comes out. He pins Apollo Crews. I'm not, I'm sorry. He pins uh, Shelton Benjamin, one, two, three. So he's the new 24 7 champion. Nobody cares. Then we go back. MVP, he's beating the crap out of Apollo. But um, MVP, he, you know, he actually gets pinned here. He, it's also eats the toss power bomb one two three so he's out of here last year of course dominated this thing he goes for the full nelson from simpsons he gets out of it and no apollo hits insiguri after insiguri trying to lay this guy out he hits the standing moonsault for a two count goes for the toss power bomb lashley counters hits the spear one two three Lashley wins so like I said at least the one thing the one consistent that they're doing right through this whole mid-card United States championship feud is even though Apollo Crews is the champion Lashley is the top guy out of everybody involved and that's the right thing that they're doing here so the announcers they run down you know pretty much the entire card for SummerSlam after this they look oh yeah you know this is all awesome and then we see Shane McMahon he's talking with Marina Shafir Jessamine Duke backstage so then we get a 24-7 championship match. You know, this Raw, it kept going. It's like, okay, you know, like legit, you know, bullshit. Oh, here's like a legit Mysterio thing. Oh, okay, back down to bullshit. And, you know, they lock up pretty much Tozawa. You know, he gets a little bit of offense. You know, he goes up top, I guess going for the senton. He didn't really even try to like, you know, do the senton. He just jumped off and landed on his feet because uh, Cedric rolled out of the way. He eventually, you know, hits the lumbar check one two three for the win but as soon as this thing is over Shelton Benjamin comes out hits the pay dirt and the pinfall so he's now the 24 7 championship our champion again I literally don't care so next week Ivar will fight Dolph Ziggler in the Raw Underground and then when we're back in Underground uh, Marina Shafir's debut she hits judo throw and then pulls the other girl by her hair and you know Shafir looks good, and then obviously she wins this thing. You're not going to have her debut against some unknown, you know, jobber from the crowd and lose. But then as she's celebrating, Nia Jax attacks her from behind. Jessamine Duke goes to jump on the mat, but uh, Nia Jax kicks her in the face. You know, I, I get Nia Jax is big and whatever, but I, I just don't care or like and agree with how they're pushing her. Sheena jumps on the mat, and the referee rings the bell, but Nia jumps off and runs away. That's funny. Probably more like waddles away, but what are you going to do? Um, then Selena and Garza, they're, uh, they're in the ring, and then out come the Street Profits. So now we get a match, which I don't even know why this match happened. I don't even know if this was announced before. They just threw this thing together. But we get Montez Ford with his crew versus Andrade and the rest of the heel team. So here we go. I mean, 
this match was was good in the sense where it's like I like Montez Ford. I like what he does in the ring. He's the star of the team. He has all the charisma. He has the moves. Angelo Dawkins to me, I like this team when they first, you know, when they came when they were in NXT and they first got called up. Okay, legit. Ever since they did that, you know, competition, anything you can do, we can do better against the Viking Raiders. I could care less about either of these two teams. And then especially what they're doing to Eric, making him like a jobber, even though this dude could probably rip half the roster in half. But what are you going to do? So Montez Ford, he obviously looks dominant in this thing. You know, he's – um because why not? You know, he was just poisoned. Andrade's a hell of an athlete. You know, he was a former United States champion. Why would you make Andrade look dominant? But towards the end of this thing, um, Zelina's up on the apron. Montez Ford's up top. I don't know if he's going for the taste the heavens or whatever the hell it's called. The you know the frog splash he does or from the heavens. But he's up top. There's Zelina's on the apron. She's like, hey, hey, hey. And it's like she didn't look like she was going to shake the rope. She didn't look like she was going to do anything. I don't know why Montez even stopped to like acknowledge her. But that gave enough time for Bianca Belair to come out. She rips Zelina off the apron. He starts, uh, you know, Ford's like, oh, this is legit, you know. And then Andrade's like, oh, no, what are you doing? Like a dumb idiot. He gets rolled up. One, two, three. And that's pretty much it. You know, does anybody – I don't understand how, like, you get excited for this. Like I said, if the feud would have just been, you know, you poison Montez Ford and – you know, oh, we we don't see him tonight. We don't even know. Oh, he's still in the hospital. And Angelo Dawkins could have been all like, so, you know, or he could have even cut a fiery promo and been like, I don't care if I have to face you guys two on one in a handicap match. You know, I'm going to defend this titles because even though I don't have my brother here with me in person, he's with me in spirit. And there's one thing that we want, and that's the smoke. So, you know, you could have did something like that. Instead, you got to bring him back, you know, and they beat the heels. Yeah, um, Garza beat – um Ivar in a, some bullshit match beforehand fighting over some chick from The Bachelor. But see, that's how convoluted this feud is. Nobody cares at this point. So then we get Shawn Michaels. He leaves his room. You know, he's getting ready to head towards the ring. And he's like, you know, I'm going to be talking to Randy Orton. But does he actually get to talk to Randy Orton? Let's find out. So the heartbreak kid, he makes his entrance. You know, they play the whole music. He does the poses and stuff. And I like you know, even though it's like, ah, is Michael's hamming it up? You know, maybe a little bit, but I'd rather have him do that than just walk to the ring as his music plays. And it's like, really, you're not going to give us a little bit of, you know, a little bit of the pose and a little bit of something. So, so that was cool to see him do that. So then we see obviously a recap of, uh, you know, everything that happened last week with Ric Flair and this and that. And Michael says that he watched that last week in tears with Rick, you know, recounting the worst days of his life on his deathbed or so he thought and he said that you have to understand that Rick loved performing and wrestling more than anything else and if it wasn't for Rick Flair there would be no Shawn Michaels, Triple H, Edge, Batista, Christian, Drew McIntyre or Randy Orton and he said unlike you know the rest of them Randy has never had respect for Rick Flair that they do Randy had Flair, the greatest ever, as his manager, his mentor, since he broke into the business, and he didn't appreciate it. Sean says that he doesn't know, but he can assure Orton that he will receive justice, either at the hands of Sweet Chin Music or a Claymore kick, and he will see it coming. So Michaels can still hit a legit promo when he wants to. That's one good thing to see. Now, obviously, he has to tease the fans, oh, maybe Orton will eat a Sweet Chin Music. You know, the way that they have payback a week after – SummerSlam, I could honestly see some screwing, some screwy shit happening, which we'll get into in previous predictions. But I could see maybe Drew retaining here, getting his big win at SummerSlam, but then losing it at Payback, which I think they should do. But we'll see. So then, obviously, you know, when he finishes that line and he will see it coming, the one thing Michaels didn't see coming was an RKO. Boom, he hits an RKO. Michaels kind of gets on his hands and knees, sets up the punt. Boom, punt, and then Drew McIntyre runs down to the ring. Orton stands behind. You know, he's kind of smiling. He's like, ha, ha, ha. You know, he's, he runs out. He's like hiding behind the plexiglass. So then Drew, he's like, oh, screw you, guy. He goes to check on uh, Michaels. He's like, oh, you're, oh, you're right, Sean. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I couldn't help you. I'm sorry. And then Randy, he tries to snake back into the ring, and Drew, you know, they start fighting Drew's throwing him all over the place, throwing him in the plexiglass, throwing him on the announcer's table. 
you know, the ref comes out. I believe it was John Cohn. He's the only ref that I know who has a name. And, you know, they're kind of, he's like, oh, can you call for a medic? And I actually like how you saw him reach back on his, on his little, like, uh, radio, whatever you want to call it. He turned it on. He's like, oh, can we get some medics? Can we get some help out here? So it's like, oh, you actually do it. You know, you actually show it. And it makes me think, oh, he legit called someone. Did we ever see those people come out? No, but, you know, as all this is going on, Randy Orton sneaks back into the ring. He hits the RKO. And then, of course, you know, Drew sold the shit out of it. I love when Drew takes the RKO because he just goes completely limp. But when you see, like he said, a six foot six, six seven, you know, 260, 265 pound guy just go completely just limp on the mat, you know, and really sell it, that definitely makes the move extremely devastating. So Randy Orton, he stands tall at the end of this thing. And again, that's why I really think just the way they have the schedule and the way everything's set up. And as much as they're really behind Drew, I don't think they're just going to have him boom RKO with Dunn at SummerSlam. I think he's going to win. He's going to retain. And I think there's going to be some bullshit. And that's why, you know, there's going to be some payback from Randy Orton. But that was the show. Like I said, there was a lot. I, I don't even want to say a lot. There, there was some good in this. And I'm, I say it every single week, and I'm going to keep saying it until something happens. So I'm probably going to be saying it for 30, in 30 years from now. But they need to have the show be two hours. There's no way that the show is enjoyable at three. They have proven over the past how many episodes, weeks, months, years, whatever you want to go, that they cannot write a good three-hour show. If you cut out everything with like the 24-7 championship and you cut out and you trim the fat on the mid-card title, and you get rid of, you know, some of the useless Raw Underground segments. And like I said, everything with, you know, Demi and the Viking Raiders and, you know, Zelina and all this, like, you know, all this garbage from the Raw Tag Team Championship feud. Then Monday Night Raw would actually be a pretty enjoyable show. Because the, the things that are really carrying it right now is two feuds that are soon going to be over. This Rey Mysterio and, uh, or the Mysterio family and the Monday Night Messiah feud, that can't go on much longer. Same thing with Drew and uh, Randy Orton, especially because payback is next week. It's not like payback is next month and they could stretch it out another month, which I don't even know if I give them, you know, credit to write, you know, something till next month. So when these two feuds end, like I said, which is coming soon, I don't, I can't think of anything on Monday Night Raw that's going to be good. Which baby faces are you going to feud with Randy Orton when he wins the title? Because the, the way they have it is going to be Edge. Well, Edge didn't do back until you know, next year, who are you going to feud him with? There's no baby faces. Mysterio, he's blind. Dominic, he's going to be beat up. Kevin Owens, we saw that. You know, you don't build up any new stars. What's Randy Orton going to do? So I really don't know, guys. Like I said, it's kind of all up in the air. I mean, even if Drew wins, they really didn't build up any new heels. So Monday Night Raw is a mess. Like I said, guys, I can't believe I'm saying it, but if you're going to watch anything on the main roster, just stick to Fridays. That show is at least actually presented in a somewhat more legit, consistent manner. So, guys, there's the review. You know, thank you all so much for watching. You know, stay tuned. Obviously, subscribe if you haven't already. The original Rope Break and the other social medias, you can find us on Facebook under Rope Break, the original Rope Break. You can find us on Instagram, the original Rope Break, and Twitter, the OG Rope Break. And, you know, but follow us on all of them because, like I said, we have a busy week. We have Emergence, you know, tomorrow night. And then we have that... NXT on Wednesday actually normally it's AEW but because of the NBA playoffs or whatever it is that's going to be moved to Saturday so we're going to have you know NXT Wednesday night and then we're going to have Friday night Smackdown previews and predictions in there somewhere as well Saturday is the busy day because we're going to have NXT TakeOver 30 AEW Dynamite review following that so that's going to be late night so for all you third shifters you're in for luck everyone else you'll wake up to probably a plethora of rope break in the inbox so make sure you know, you turn on that bell so you don't miss a thing. And thumbs up all the videos. We greatly appreciate it. And then, obviously, Sunday, we had the greatest party of the summer, SummerSlam. So, guys, thank you so much. Stay tuned for all that great content. And we'll see you Tuesday night for Emergence.